All right. Thank you very much for uh, the introduction, Salim. And also, it's very interesting to watch our own radiobiologist ask questions in front of the audience to our clinician, how it should be practiced. So uh, I would like to welcome everyone coming back to Detroit and uh, have this wonderful uh, course. So I'm going to continue the discussion regarding the clinical targets and the treatment planning. So the focus will be on the brain and the spine, and also touch a little bit about lung. So here's a complete interest. So the objective today is uh, for the brain, um, main focus is on the brain mats, and then we'll talk about prescription dose and optimization of prescription isodose line, treatment delivery technique, and also uh, it's getting very popular and hot, single iso multi-target treatment. For the spine, we also mainly focus on spine mites. We'll go over the dosimetric review and uh, compare MRT versus v mite. And the one specific thing I want to talk about is about those gray sites used for spine radio surgery. And also, we'll talk about early stage lung smell cell cancer and uh, regarding the treatment plan and uh, planning evaluation as, as well as those calculation algorithms. So as Salim uh, just mentioned, actually, you know, brain radio surgery has been developed for almost a century, and uh, it's been working on uh, brain metastasis, uh, primary brain tumors such as GBM, and uh, benign tumor like a uh, pituitary gland, mini geoma, and also uh, vascular lesions like AVM, and also functional disease, as I think is getting uh, a lot of attention these days. Besides trigeminal neurogia, also we're looking at Parkinson's disease, et cetera. So there's a, a variety of different applications of radio surgery in brain. And uh, I will just focus on the brain mass. Just the reason is, I think regarding uh, planning technique, there are a lot of overlap. And if we know one, we think we can easily to implement to other treatment sites. So, uh, you know, uh, radio surgery has been really a very effective tool to treat uh, brain mass. And it used to be to focus on small solitary lesion. And also now it's getting really popular to treat multiple lesions and also at the same time. And uh, uh, Salim also mentioned about the post-operative lesions, and we'll collaborate with uh, neurosurgeons, and after the patient has surgery, and we'll come uh, to uh, our department for this uh, treatment. And also, actually, we have been also investigating to treating large brain mass. As I mentioned, uh, it's about diameter is about 3 cm, or the volume size is about over 20 cc. And you'll see there's really a treatment uh, paradigm changing, I think, in the last uh, uh, decade. Uh, especially in this year, in the ESCO 2015, uh, there was a release that, you know, for patients with limited brain mass, I think it driven the whole brain radiation, uh, radiation therapy. Actually, it does not improve the uh, uh, survival, and also it increases uh, cogn uh, cognitive uh, decline. So radio surgery will see play more and more important role to treat brain mass. And uh, uh, Dr. Sadiqi just went over about RTOG protocol. This is really a very important protocol uh, because it studied, you know, uh, based on the toxicity to evaluate prescription dose uh, versus the tumor size. And as he mentioned, uh, uh, the maximum tolerated dose for uh, diameter less than about 2 cm is about 24 gray. And the tumor size increase, you may consider to reduce the prescription dose down to 15 gray. So, you know, the prescription dose has been personalized, really depending on the tumor size. You know, as a physicist, our question would be, should we also consider uh, optimize the prescription isodose line depending on the lesion size? So, you know, gamma life has been historically prescribed at 50%, and lean life probably 80 to 90%. So, you know, the question for us is, what's really the optimal isodose line? And it should really lead to a plan with, you know, the highest uh, therapeutic ratio and with a better uh, target coverage and also uh, giving a low dose to the normal tissue. So uh, in this uh, area, we are looking at personalized treatment. I think prescription isodose line should be next thing, should be uh, explored to see whether we can really optimize uh, treatment for each single patient. So we are starting this optimal uh, prescription isodose line depending on the size of the target. So we start with this gradient index. I think everybody you know, doing radio surgery is really familiar with uh, this key element, uh, which is defined by 50% of the uh, uh, prescription isodose divided by the total target volume. And uh, why do we use this uh, index? There's a reason for it. You know, for, as Salim just mentioned, our prescription dose usually is about 18 to 20 gray. So if you look at 50%, which is usually about 8 to 10 gray, 8 to 10 gray is really a very important indicator for the brain uh, necrosis, which has been published previously, who be a very important uh, uh, way to evaluate potential uh, brain necrosis. Therefore, you know, if we have a smaller gradient index, basically it's corresponding to a very uh, less uh, dose to the normal brain to uh, about 8 to 10 degree. And uh, then that's why we consider this one as a clinically relevant criteria to correlate to the therapeutic ratio. So, oops. 
here is the method. Basically, we evaluate 30 patients uh, using our system. And for each patient, we develop about six to eight different plans. And by uh, varying you know, MLC margin, then you can really change the uh, prescription out of those line from negative two millimeter up to two uh, millimeter. So uh, we just use a dynamic conformal arc to just streamline the study. So some complex cases uh, which require uh, MRT is excluded. So all the cases being normalized so that 95% target volume can receive the prescription dose. And then here is just a result. I can show you this curve uh, compares the uh, gradient index versus the prescription acidose line. Each line represents basically one patient. I can, you can say there are about uh, six different points which represent the plan. And you can see uh, there's a clear trend. As the tumor size uh, is growing, the, prescri uh, the, uh, the optimal uh, prescription acidose line, which with, with a, a minimum uh, gradient index, actually is tend to shift it towards a larger prescription acidose line. And uh, you can see uh, in this curve, basically, this is our typical treated uh, acidose line about, for the LINAC base, it's about 80 to 90 percent. But if you really look at our study, and you can see this log very clearly for the small uh, lesions, probably the optimal uh, prescription acidose line, which should be about 50 percent, which usually, you know, uh, implement in the gamma knife treatment. So, you know, we do see this strong correlation between the optimal uh, prescription acidose line and the nature log of this uh, target volume. And uh, uh, apparently, this optimal acidose line is usually between 50 and 75 percent. So, you know, uh, gamma knife taking about the one side and the lean about taking the other extreme. So, maybe it's uh, of considering in future to really optimize that. Which one? Which it means for the smaller volume, you may consider a uh, lower prescription acidose line. And in the meantime, for the large target volume, maybe we can prescribe higher. So uh, this is our just uh, current study, and we are trying to do the modeling for the uh, radio necrosis and hope to publish another paper. But this is still a retrospective study, which really need a, a large uh, group collaboration to consider in future whether this should be implemented in the clinic. Uh, overall. So let's go over a little bit about the treatment delivery. You know, arc therapy is really being a uh, golden standard for, uh, for the, on the lean based treatment on the brain uh, treatment. And uh, especially in the old days, circular cone has been used uh, uh, a lot. And uh, uh, it's really, really good for, for the severe target. Uh, you, you can achieve very good conformity. But the challenge is really for the re irregular shape. Basically, you have to use some multiple isocenters. Then you really get some hot spot uh, when you have overlap. So dynamic conform arc has been really being used, I think, uh, for radio surgery uh, for the last, uh, last ten, uh, decade. And uh, it's basically the MLC dynamically conforms the target as gantry rotates. So you can really achieve very good conformity, which you can see here. This is just a comparison between conformal uh, cone-based uh, treatment and dynamic conform arc. You can really achieve very uh, good plan if it's a severe target. But if you for the irregular one, basically, if you, you try to use multi-ISO for the cone-based uh, planning, you may get a very hot spot uh, over here. And if you look at normal brain dose, you will see significantly higher uh, normal brain dose if you uh, use uh, multiple isocenters. So intensity modulated radiation therapy has also been used to treat irregular shape. And uh, especially for brain, probably you can use a lot of non coplanar beams to reach a uh, very good conformity. But if you compare dynamic conformal arc and IMRT, basically, I think the challenge is really for the large tumor. If you use dynamic conformal arc, basically, uh, you will see the hot spot in this uh, superior region because all the arcs coming from the superior region, so they do have a lot of overlapping, which produce hot spot, which do, you do not get a uh, uniform dose distribution within the target. In that kind of case, probably MRT will be a better solution. Uh, you know, these days, VMAT has been really advanced and uh, improved efficiency and also deliver uh, and uh, planning. So basically, you can vary those three MLC leaf speed, gantry speed, and uh, to deliver in a very efficient way and also very effective way to treat uh, brain mats. So next question, I want to just a little bit discuss about this leaf size. I think these days, nobody really uses uh, 1, 1 cm uh, MLC leaf size. But I think still a lot of clinics used to have 5 millimeter. So the question for you, like, uh, if we have this LINAC available and our physician brings up a question, can we treat brain mats? And uh, this is, I think, a very good study to evaluate the impact on, of the leaf size uh, on the target volume. So basically, uh, you can see we evaluate the conformality index versus the target volume at different size from up to really a uh, large volume. And uh, this is a very busy curve. And I want to just maybe uh, look at the ratio uh, between uh, 5 millimeter leaf size to 3 and 10 millimeter to 3. And you look at this fitting curve. Basically, you can see for the very small lesions, 
uh, you, this uh, uh, conformality index will be increased a lot if you use five millimeter. So you may be able to set up a boundary. Let's say if this region is really le less than about uh, uh, five cc, you may not be able to trade on a regular uh, lead neck with five millimeter leaf size. But if you have high definition leaf size, you, you may be able to trade. So this can give you a guidance for you to decide what kind of patient you can trade uh, on your regular lead neck. And the uh, next thing I want to talk about is the block margin. You know, usually in the old days for the 3D planning, we do give a relatively large block margin. And usually uh, the reason is uh, you want to achieve very uniform dose across the target. So basically you can allow, uh, the, the problem for the large block margin is that the dose drop off is usually uh, gradual. But of course you get very uniform dose. The maximum dose within the target is usually very low. However, for radio surgery, usually you give very uh, small block margin, uh, zero or one millimeter. And uh, the, the reason to push the dose really higher is that you really try to achieve you know, this benefit with a very sharp dose gradient once you, once you give very uh, small block margin. And uh, uh, the, but the challenge is uh, you know, the maximum dose is about much higher compared to a large block margin. But you know, we are, when we are talking about uh, radio surgery, you are really treating the tumor itself. Maybe the higher dose inside the tumor, which is a beneficial thing for the physician to consider. So now let's look at this impact of MLC margin to the conformality index. And uh, we, again, you know, evaluate uh, two different patients uh, with, uh, on three different MLC leaf size, three, five, and 10. And also we evaluate different MLC margins. And you can see that uh, probably if you give zero to one millimeter block margin, you can really achieve very good conformality index. In the meantime, your gradient index will also be improved. So just a summary of this dynamic conform mark. Uh, this ratio of conformity index really depends on your target volume. And for the very small one, you know, the difference, you, if you use large leaf size, like five millimeter or 10 millimeter, you may be really be cautious to use that because you will give a lot, lot of dose to the normal tissue. But on the other side, you can also think about, because the tumor is, itself is really small, the dose deposited to the normal tissue may not be significant. I think that's a judgment for the uh, clinician to, to evaluate the plan and to decide whether the patient can be treated. And uh, uh, for the really relatively large one, you really don't see the difference. You can uh, easily to implement uh, uh, on any kind of LINAC. So now I want to talk about single ISO multi-target. Uh, basically, there are two different ways to do it. Either you can use dynamic conformal arc, which has been historically used for brain mass treatment, or you can use VMAT. So we, had, we developed this kind of technique called shared ISO center dynamic conformal arc. Basically, each metastasis is treated with one group of arc, four to five. And, uh, but all these ARC groups can share the same ISO center. Or you can just use VMAT. Basically, you use all the ARCs treating all the lesions with a shared ISO center, which is more efficient. We'll see the uh, comparison I'm going to sh uh, share with you. And uh, the benefit, of course, you, know, you just need to set up patient once, and you can even optimize the ARC uh, fields. Therefore, you can really deliver, deliver it, uh, the treatment very efficiently. But uh, the very big concern is about this residual angular uncertainty, which also I will share. Uh, uh, what will be impact on the dosimetric, uh, dosimetric uh, evaluation. So this is really a nice paper published by UAB, I think, in Pro. And it's talking, they developed a recipe uh, for using the VMAT technique to treat single ISO with multi-targets. And uh, basically, if you look at the appendix, basically, it's very important to uh, develop this, uh, the ring structures. Not only one, but they did three. Uh, inner control, middle control, and outer control. And uh, basically, as a distance from uh, five millimeter 10 cm and the 3 cm away. The reason is really to push the dose down to the uh, tumor and in the meantime, minimize the normal tissue dose. And also they give some recommendation about the number of arcs you use. Maybe for one or two lesions, you can use just one or two arcs. If you are treating to more and more lesions, uh, let's say up to 10 lesions, you may need to consider five arcs at least. So we did some study to compare dynamic conformal arc versus VMAT. Which one is really superior and we should use in the clinic? So uh, as uh, probably that study can mention about this, uh, in our clinic, we don't treat uh, uh, brain mass. Uh, if we have a patient has over six brain mass, we just usually treat the patient with a whole brain. We do not treat over that. That's why our study is limited to six lesions. But I do know some other institutions, they may consider treating much more, let's say up to 10 lesions. So here is just some uh, characteristics of the patient that uh, for uh, the the legion size, uh, number of legions range from three to f uh, five. And uh, the, you can see the smallest uh, uh, PTV size is about only 0.03 cc. And the largest one can go 2.75. And here shows the median distance between all the legions, range uh, from like four to seven 
uh, actually three to seven centimeter. So this shows just one case, I think, with five regions you can see over here, where the isocenter is identified here. So we plan with two different technologies, basically uh, dynamic conform mark and the VMAT. So we use those uh, uh, elements to evaluate the plan. You know, uh, conformality index uh, from both RTOG and PADIC, and also gradient index. So here, just to show you some statistics uh, of those results. So regarding the uh, conformality index, you really see there's no significant difference, no matter you use the RTOG criteria or PADIC criteria. So they are really uh, very similar. So you can achieve very good tumor coverage using either one. But the really challenge is on the gradient index. If you look at here, actually the VMAT, the gradient index is much higher compared to the dynamic conform mark. I would say one reason is that, you know, for the, this dynamic conform mark, what we do is for each legion, we use three to four arcs to uh, deliver the dose. In the meantime, so if you have three legions, it may up to 10 arcs. But for the VMAT, usually we limit it only to four arcs. That would be one reason. Probably uh, the gradient, you have more focused arcs on each legion, you can achieve better gradient index. I want to show you just one example, compare the VMAT versus you know, dynamic conform arc. Basically, you can see the challenge is really at the normal uh, brain dose. You can see a low uh, dose spillage uh, in the VMAT compared to the uh, dynamic conform arc in this case. So next thing I want to talk about sensitivity to this setup uncertainties. You know, we, we all know that uh, translational uncertainty is very important for brain radio surgery. Actually, even one millimeter uh, local uh, displacement, you can have significant uh, uh, deviation just because uh, usually the region itself is very small. And in this case, we evaluated this one millimeter, we induced this uncertainty and compare both VMAT and the dynamic conform arc. And you can see actually it's highly, uh, uh, dynamic conform arc is very sensitive uh, to this uh, local displacement compared to VMAT, but both you have significant dose drop off even with the one millimeter uh, translational uh, deviation. But the more interesting is about rotational uh, deviation because in the, you know in the past we don't really worry too much about that because most of our legions are severe target and uh, even with some kind of degree rotation you may not see much dosimetric impact. However, if your ISO center is further away from the legion and any even one degree rotation you may be about you may, you might miss the legion if the legion itself is small. So we did some study on this. You can look at this one degree rotation and compare with. Uh, dynamic conformal arc and also VMAT. Actually, uh, for a legion, it really depending on the legion size. I'm talking about a legion which is 5 cm diameter, which is a relatively large legion. So one degree rotation, you can have about 6% dose drop off on your coverage, which that's why you, it's very important to evaluate your setup and uh, uh, accuracy. So conclusion, you know, both techniques can produce very highly, you know, conformal plans. And uh, actually, in this case, in that study, dynamic conform mark actually has a really sharper dose gradient. But also, it's very important to make sure uh, your setup tolerance to be really suitable to ensure the quality of the, this single iso multi target delivery. But that's not really the end of the story. You know, the game, I would say, for VMAT has just uh, really begun. So what should we look at? How do we really improve the VMAT? So here is uh, the real trouble, you know, using the VMAT. If you look at this uh, case with three legions here, and the reason we got very high uh, low dose spillage is just because it's island blocking problem. You can see there are three legions here, and for the MLC, right, try to deliver uh, dose to both legions. They are trying to not close both legions. Therefore, there's a large opening in between. That's why, you know, during the VMAT delivery, you will see this uh, low dose spillage around. So how do we solve this problem? I think the best way is just to do the geometric optimization, which you can optimize the collimeter angle and the couch angle to avoid that. Let's say in this case, if your collimeter rotate like a, a 70, 80 degree, the leaf going through this direction, you can really uh, avoid a lot of, you know, low dose spillage in this regard. So that's something actually we have been uh, using some scripting in-house to come up with a recommended uh, uh, collimator and couch angle for our VMAT plan. So if we consider this problem, I think VMAT uh, can be further improved to provide both of our excellent uh, conformality index and also can reduce a lot of spillage. And I can show you this one example just by optimizing the collimator and couch angle itself. You can see without optimization, with uh, using with our typical set setup, you will see a lot of low dose spillage. But if you can really optimize that, you can reduce that significantly. So I want to just share uh, your one case to end the session. Basically, this is the one case, actually the first case we treated with this technique using VMAT. So 46-year-old, um, uh, 
uh, bladder cancer, and actually we have three mites in the left frontal and parietal region. So two of lesions share in the same axial view, and the two of lesions share in the same chronal view. Prescription is 18 grade, 90% to all of them, and we use three arcs at uh, three different couch angles, 0, 3, and 60. So usually you know, our setup is you know you do comb CT for the initial alignment and always you do a uh, 2D 3D matching using the uh, orthogonal pair images to verify it and also not only uh, before the treatment but also the joint the treatment the, the key reason is that as I mentioned any potential motion during the treatment can have significant dosimetric impact for the single isomer multi target delivery and that's why usually our practice is take the images before each. Uh, at each couch position before delivery to make sure the patient uh, still, uh, uh, still the patient set up within our tolerance is about one millimeter, one degree. And I can show you about that before each uh, treatment uh, for each arc, we do verify the result. And, and uh, here also, regarding patient QA, I think you'll uh, hear more later on. I just want to mention one thing. What we do is, because it's a new technology, what we really care is we measure at each single lesion, not just uh, 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 one plan, but we try to capture the lesion at each plan in order to evaluate uh, the delivery accuracy. In the meantime, it's not good practice to measure at ISO center because it's really, really very low dose. And we do shift to each lesion and to measure under the lesion. So, you know, the treatment time is really awesome. For that case, you know, setup time is about only seven minutes. Your imaging time is about eight minutes. And the treatment, actually, the beam mount time is much less. I would say about three, four minutes. The reason we take about 20 minutes is we, uh, the reason is that we still do the image verification be uh, before each uh, arc treatment. That's why it takes longer time. And still, you can treat three to five lesions within about half an hour, which is a really efficient way to treat. That's why that's another reason we can treat more and more uh, uh, brain mass lesions. So now let's just go to the same question. So the first one, uh, let's look at this cartoon. This uh, chrono uh, cranial image is below. And actually, the red dots basically re represent all the lesions. So the question is, which would be an appropriate candidate for radio surgery of less than 18 gray? Excellent. So actually, the answer would be A. Actually, the, it's based on the RTOJ criteria. For the really large lesion over 3 cm, probably it's, going to, it's better to reduce the dose to down to 15 to 16 gray. Actually, uh, you can see, if you got, since I work with Dr. Sadiqi, uh, so often, actually, we are thinking about the same thing. Even the same question is very similar. <laughs> so the next same question. Uh, which of the following statement is not true about the single ISO multi-target delivery? So it can be achieved by dynamic conform arc. It can be achieved by v -mite. The angular setup deviation does not have much dosimetric impact on the delivery. The narrower leaf width MLC provides better dose conformity than the wider ones for dynamic conform arc. And the prescription ISO dose can be optimized based on the lesion size to improve therapeutic ratio. Great, yeah, the answer is number three. So as I just uh, mentioned, one degree rotation can lead up to 6% dose drop off in D95 for a legion with a diameter about five cm, which is a relatively large legion. So now, now let's go to the spine radio surgery. So, uh, you know, we're really pioneer in spine radio surgery since uh, uh, 2001. And, uh, you know, compared to brain radio surgery, actually, you know, both started about the same time, almost like a century ago. However, sp spine radio surgery has been really, has not much development in the last century. I think the key challenge for spine is the immobilization. And in the old days, it's very invasive procedure. You have to use the clamps to clamp the patient's spinal process in order to immobilize the patient. That's why it's very limited for radio surgery. However, as you know, the delivery technique has been improved, immobilization device has been improved. And we are able to deliver uh, radio surgery with high dose to, uh, in a non-invasive way. So at 24, we started our phase one study in about 2001. 
and uh, to evaluate the accuracy, QA, uh, even that time MRT is still relatively new thing. We are trying to see whether MRT can be really used to deliver highly conformal dose to the spy in the meantime or avoid the dose to the court. And now we move more to, towards the efficacy, uh, evaluating spine metastasis, core compression, recurrent spinal, uh, spine mice, and the primary spine tumors. And the RTOG uh, study right now has been under the phase three. And uh, so, you know, here is good way of being treating uh, uh, on the spine tumors, not only the spine metastasis, we do treat like benign tumors, malignant bony tumors, and also some uh, intradural spine tumors. Actually, like epidemoma, it's really challenging because you're treating like partial of the cord, which gives give me very high dose. How do you preserve the rest of the cord, which is very challenging. We do see some cases occasionally, but today my talk will be uh, mainly focused on the spine metastasis. So this is a dosimetry study uh, about 124 uh, patients who received 18 gray for spine radio surgery. The prescription answered those lines of 90%. And actually, you can see the most uh, primary diagnosis are coming from lung, prostate, and the breast. And regarding the uh, C spine, we have about 20 patients, and the T spine, about 100 patients, and the lumbar spine, about 40 patients. And as uh, Dr. Sadiq mentioned, actually, uh, we do counter the entire element, not just uh, uh, the gross tumor shown in the image. So uh, for the anterior element, uh, uh, vertical body, so we have about uh, 128 patients. For the posterior, posterior uh, spinal process, and we have about uh, 20 patients. And then we do have some kind of called donut treatment. Basically, you know, your targets wrap around uh, the cord, and you try to preserve the cord, which is really challenging, no matter for the planning and the delivery. So we have about 18, uh, 17 patients. So here is just the dosimetric result about the target and the, some OARs. And you, you can see our prescription is 18 gray, and uh, usually the DMAX is about 21 gray. So your hotspot is about 20 to 25 percent. And uh, you're able to achieve very good coverage, usually it's about 99 percent of the, no matter uh, what's kind of side, no matter it's uh, anterior or posterior element. And we do consider uh, uh, OARs including esophagus, trachea, and the oropharynx and the kidney. But uh, uh, in this report, about over 100 patients, we do not see any side effects um, of those except the oropharynx. Uh, I'll mention that a little bit late. So this will be a very good statistics. If you decide to st uh, start your spine radio surgery protocol, maybe that will be a very good reference for you to consider the uh, organ tolerance. So, but the most you know, critical, critical organ is really the cord. And, and actually, what we do is we do evaluate the partial volume, which is you know extending from six millimeter above to six millimeter below the target volume for the cord. And also, we do evaluate uh, uh, maximum cord dose as well. So you can you can see for those kind of cases, generally for ten percent of uh, cord, we can receive about eight gray. And, uh, uh, and the maximum dose usually is about uh, on the level about thirteen to fourteen gray. And actually, this is a really a serious study reported by uh, multiple different institutions regarding uh, the radiation induced uh, myelopsy. And actually, in our study, uh, I think over the past like 230 patients, there was only one reported uh, myelopsy. Uh, and uh, if you s look at other institutions like PMH, and they all use different uh, dose fractions. So we do the single shot uh, at Henry Ford, but I know there are some other institutions, they would like to try to two or three fractions instead to make sure they can have a little bit uh, tolerance uh, regarding the setup uncertainty, et cetera. And you can see they have different reports here. And also Stanford actually gives published uh, as over uh, the past 1,000 patients, she has reported six patients with um, myelopsy. So regarding the clinical outcome of those 128 patients, the overall survival is about eight months, and uh, our uh, follow-up is about seven months. And you, you do say uh, there's uh, really a beneficial uh, to have pain control using radio surgery. Uh, over about 92 patients has really uh, uh, neurologic symptom improvement. And uh, the mean time to simple, uh, symptom control is really fast, about uh, on the average about uh, two weeks. And uh, some really can happen within an hour, uh, within one day. So which, that's why we do a lot of uh, uh, stereotactic, uh, stereotactic treatment on spine cases. And we do see really less uh, recurrency about less than 5%. And also our prescription is uh, leveraged like uh, uh, 18 gray. So we do see less uh, fracture of the bone. If you go really high dose, maybe the fracture of the bone will uh, 
uh, the rate will be increased. That's something you also need to be uh, considered. And but the only thing is that we do see the grade one oral mucositis for the patients at risk for the oral pharyngeal toxicity. That's the general the toxicity we, we see uh, for the C-SPAN patients. So whether we should use MRT or VMAT, most of the time it's uh, really depending on your clinical evaluation. And uh, you can use the VMAT with two arcs. And uh, for some cases like this, this patient is a young female patient. Uh, our physician do not want to have, the, you do not want to use the arc just because he wants to limit the dose to the breast. Therefore, we use some posterior uh, MRT beams. And for some cases like, you know, the C-spine, you may need to consider the dental artifacts. Either you have to have certain metal reduction uh, way to reduce artifact, or you, uh, or the, General recommendation, maybe you can use uh, posterior MRT beams rather than VMAT to, to try to minimize those uncertainties. So regarding the dosimetry those wise, to compare MRT versus VMAT, so again, you know, these very standard uh, evaluation elements, gradient index and the conformality index, uh, those two fall off, especially it's very important for spine, just we do evaluate from the prescription at the dose line 18 grade to the dose drop off to 10 grade because we use a 10 grade as a really a criteria to evaluate uh, spinal cord dose. And you can see in this case, for the VMAC case, we are able to achieve the, uh, this dose drop off about uh, only two millimeter from 18 grade to 10 grade. And uh, for the MRT, it's a little bit larger, about four, uh, four millimeter. And we look at the MU and beam on time. So our study, we use six X uh, FFF beam and compare with, you know, our typically MRT setup is, you know, seven to nine posterior beams, 20 degree apart, 20 to 25 degree. For the VMAC, usually we just use two arcs. So this study is published in Pro to really look at the uh, dosimetric uh, comparison. And you can see regarding the PTV coverage, there's really no difference. Either MRT can, or VMAC, you can achieve exactly the uh, same kind of result. The benefit really is looking at the cord. If you look at the VMAT result, actually you can reduce about one grade for the uh, D, just one percent. Actually, you know, it's very important actually as a physicist to look at the plan. Even one grade is significant also for the patient. You can see a lot of benefits to, uh, to leverage your dose. And the reason is that if you look at the gradient index, actually VMAT can also improve a little bit better gradient index. The dose drop off is sharper. That's why you can really reduce the dose uh, to the cord. And actually, if you look at beam on time, there's really no difference. The reason is that right now you can really auto, be, auto sequence all the MRT beams. So you don't really need to uh, involve uh, this uh, to mold up the beam uh, one by one. So it's not going to delay your treatment. And the beam on time, you can see with FFF beam, you can reduce to about five, six minutes beam on time, which is really important for spine radio surgery because most of patients suffer a lot of pain. They may not be able to stay on the couch for too, too, too long. So basically, uh, we are able to uh, obtain really a relatively sharper dose gradient. If you use a combination of VMAT and uh, FFF beam, you can see this comparison. Uh, regarding the VMAT, dose drop-off is a little bit sharper. And uh, we kind of favor uh, uh, 6x instead of 10x, just because of uh, core dose. But for really large patients, we still use 10x as an alternative. So a uh, last thing for spine radio surgery, I do want to mention about those grid size. You know, grid size is very important thing. When you consider the small tumor, probably you know you should really change the grid size to, let's say, to under uh, 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 one millimeter. But span, most of the time, the volume size is large. You may have a span volume of maybe 50 cc. That's not, not something like uh, triggering you to consider the grid, those grid size. But the reason it's very important is we do worry about those gradients. Because as I mentioned, those gradients are so, so sharp. Uh, you have like uh, eight grade dose drop off in two to three millimeter. So without using the finer grade size, you are, uh, the, the accuracy will be uh, degraded. If you look at this case, uh, the same plan uh, computed with 2.5 millimeter grade size versus one millimeter. And you can see the core dose is actually reduced if you use one millimeter compared to 2.5. There's really no difference uh, on the target coverage. And uh, if you drop profile and you can look at, you know, this dose drop off as a gradient. And uh, but the question for us is which one is the real the truth? You need to compare with your measurement to see whether really one millimeter uh, uh, match reality more. So generally, uh, our program we use a film dosimetry for all the SRS uh, QA, and if you compare the film pr uh, profile against the plan profile uh, for 2.5 and one, and actually you do see uh, as a cord region which is uh, right at here. It's actually uh, the results matches uh, well for the one millimeter dose grade size. Actually, there's a lot of benefit to use one millimeter grade size. The reason is that if you look at those uh, distance uh, to drop those drop off, actually one millimeter can achieve better. 
And also, <coughs> for the cordals, you can reduce the cordals if you use one millimeter. But the key challenge if you use one millimeter is really your calculation time. If you compare one versus 2.5, it's 14 to, or actually 14 minutes for, for one millimeter, those grid size, and two, only two and a half minutes for 2.5 millimeter. So if you have like Citrix server to do the, those calculation, I think it's not a big problem. But if you have a single workstation to do a VMAT optimization and calculation, you want to m run multiple iterations, that may take you a couple of days to really come up with a good plan if you use one millimeter instead. Maybe uh, alternative is join your optimization process. You can use large those uh, grid size. And uh, in your final those calculation, you can reduce it. Actually, it will help you uh, in your plan. So as, again, as I mentioned, the film dosimetry, I, uh, personally, I think this is the best for the spine radio surgery, just because this dose gradient is so sharp, and the regular uh, 2D array is not going to capture this uh, dose drop off. And the usually what we do is we, we measure uh, in the axial plane. So we really look at those drop off from spine. This is like a donut case. You can see the tumor wrap around the cord. And you, you want, really want to know how, how your delivery uh, match your plan. Of course, there are some other things you have to consider. Uh, for span. So in conclusion, there's a significant amount of clinical benefit, neurological improvement, rapid pain control, and, uh, and also you know, spinal cord depression, decompression. And it's a non-invasive uh, procedure. It's very convenient for the patient. Uh, but there's a lot of com uh, complexity, including mobilization, as I mentioned before, and the treatment planning accuracy, QA challenge, and more important is about intra fractional motion management. I think you will hear more in the motion management session. It's not only on, we can deliver a very good plan on static phantom, it doesn't mean we can do that on a patient. If you don't manage it really well, you may eventually harm the patient more. Okay, this is the last same question. So which of the following statement is not true? VMAT is an efficient delivery method for spine radio surgery. Radio surgery is an effective tool to treat localized spine metastasis. Intrafraction motion should be monitored during spine radio surgery. Tank rate should be less than 10% of the entire human spinal cord volume. Non-invasive non immobilization can be used for spine radio surgery. Great, yeah, the answer is four. So here is just showing a diagram. We do, we, our cord, even you no know, cord is really a serial uh, organ, you do consider the maximum dose. But in the meantime, our philosophy, actually this has been published in Cancer by Dr. Yu. Uh, we do allow 10% to uh, partial volume is that, you know, at the same cross-section of the cord, you have different uh, components control different functions. Some control sensory uh, input, some control the motor movement. So that's why we, we can allow kind of those uh, uh, higher dose go across a little bit of the cord. You're not going to touch some really critical controlling f uh, component in the cord. That's why we developed this uh, criteria which is being used in RTUG. So last thing I want to talk about now is small cell lung cancer. And uh, you know, there are a lot of things to consider in, in, uh, for the lung treatment. Uh, in the simulation, you need to consider immobilization, whether you want to do some breathing control. And the 40 CT has been really standard these days to evaluate the motion. And regarding the treatment planning, you have to think about target delineation. Either you should either do it on the MIP or at each face, or how do you really rely on the pad to tell you uh, where the tumor is. And what kind of margin you should give? Different institutions really give kind of different margin. I would say the range from five to 10 millimeter. And the prescription dose is also different. Some institutions give 20 grade three fractions, which is also the RTOG protocol. But uh, later on, you know, like a new RTOG 0915, they give 12 grade times four. Which one you should think about? And those calculation technique, you have different ways, 3D, MRT, VMAT. And because it's a moving target, you do need to consider interplay effect. So when sh you should use modulation, when sh you should not use modulation, that's also a question. And of course, those calculation algorithm is really super important for, uh, for lung treatment. Uh, uh, general consensus, now you have to use certain kind of model-based convolution superposition or Monte Carlo to do the, those calculation. And the treatment is also very, very tricky. You have to consider a lot of different motion management methods, ITV, gating, or tracking. And uh, I want you to talk, co cover a little bit about the prescription. Actually, this was really a nice summary I got from the State of the Art Technique Symposium uh, held about three years ago. There was a panel with four different institutions to discuss about uh, your ITV 
uh, control prescription, etc., uh, among uh, Henry Ford, Stanford, University of Colorado, and uh, uh, Bauman. And uh, basically, you know, ITV, everybody uses uh, uh, 40 CT to counter. Some counter on each face, some counter on the MIP. And the uh, margin is quite different too. Uh, we, we use three millimeter all run and six millimeter sup superior and inferior because motion tends to move larger in that regard. And many other institutions five millimeter and Bauman use eight millimeter. And here shows the long counter. The prescription dose, uh, some institutions just give uniform dose to no matter the tumor size, 12 grade times four or 18 to uh, 20 grade times three. But like Stanford and Bauman, they do really customize prescription based on the tumor size. And uh, oh, this is for peripheral lung lesions, similar for the uh, central lung lesions of different. Regarding the image guidance, I think everybody right now just use a cone beam CT for the uh, registration. So I'm going to just cover a, a couple of things uh, in the treatment planning. Basically, it's very important to evaluate uh, this uh, those deposited outside the PTV. Basically, we contour a ring uh, with a two set margin of the PTV. <coughs> then you look at the dose outside the, uh, this uh, structure to evaluate the intermediate dose. And also, you may need to consider skin dose. You can, you can contour a ring with five millimeter below the surface. Regarding the beam setup, for the MRT, probably seven, 10, or even 12 beams, and the two or three partial arcs if you use VMAT. And we tend to use a lot of beams for 3D. And generally, we use 3D when the tumor moves really large. And you may worry about interplay effect. And the 6X FFF is kind of standard we use for uh, setup. And we do use a normal tissue optimi optimization or dose ring. Uh, same uh, philosophy, we really try to uh, push the dose down to the lesion and uh, try to minimize the dose to the lung. And uh, if you look at uh, this dose calculation, so the question is which city you should really rely on the dose calculation. Actually, this was a nice study published in the uh, Green Journal several years ago and compared you know, 3D dose calculation on the average city versus the 4D calculation on each face and accumulate those. Actually, uh, for their 10 patients, and they use the worst scenario, basically there are no margin to the ITV. And you can see they can achieve very similar uh, dosimetric result. I think right now, pretty much, I think it's a kind of very standard way to use average CT to do your dose calculation and also use that for your setup. So regarding the plan evaluation, I just, you, we try to rely on the RTOG table. Uh, for the PTV, and also we look at gradient index, and really depending on the tumor size, for the larger tumor, you can use uh, your gradient uh, uh, index is uh, relatively low. For the very small region, you may get a really high gradient index. And also it's very important to look at the intermediate dose. I would say regarding the plan, usually you can achieve very good dose uh, coverage. The main challenge is really to reach uh, this gradient index and try to mini minimize the dose uh, to the lung tissue. And of course, V20 is very standard to uh, be used for the evaluation. And it just shows you a case with conformality index, how we evaluate, and how we look at the gradient index, which is about 50% of prescription isodose line. So there are uh, multiple things you have to evaluate on the OER dose. And I'm not going to talk in detail. This was just uh, we used on, uh, based on the RTOG0915 to go over uh, every single structure. And, and I would just highlight the ribs. And especially for uh, you know, the legion attached to the rib, it's very rare we can achieve the rib dose. Actually, our physician philosophy is always, you know, tumor coverage is more important. They, don't, they do not have too much worry about rib fracture. And the most important thing is to get the tumor covered. If you have a little bit higher dose to the rib, which is generally acceptable for us. Last thing I just want to mention about those calculation algorithm. Actually, there was a nice published uh, paper in Green Journal uh, uh, two years ago. Evaluate over 100 patients uh, with five different algorithms. Some are uh, uh, equivalent path lines corrected. Uh, basically, it's a pencil beam model. Some use uh, like a triple A or Accurus XB or Claps Cone algorithm or Monte Carlo based algorithm, which is more model based uh, correction. So you can see for this kind, uh, just, I just used one case to uh, talk about this, those calculation uh, and, uh, consideration. And if your prescription is based on the uh, pencil beam, uh, uh, those calculation, usually you get your mean dose coverage to the tumor will be at least uh, uh, 20 to 25% lower if you use a uh, model-based algorithm. Therefore, it's very important to, uh, to use model-based algorithm and to re revisit your uh, prescription. And if you look at normal long dose, actually here is a cross point right at about 8.5 gray. If you look at the uh, lower dose spillage here, actually model-based uh, calculation predict a uh, relatively higher dose to the uh, uh, lower uh, to the lung dose. So why it happens? Basically, you know, there's some phantom study to illustrate this problem. Actually, this is a phantom with, uh, you know, solid water uh, sandwiched with a 
uh, long material, which uh, density is about 0.25. And you just look at PDD calculated uh, between the pencil beam and the Monte Carlo. And you can see Monte Carlo really under those. Uh, uh, but the key challenge is you look at here. Basically, once you, the particle electron say going out from the low density to a higher density, it tends to stop right away because you see this higher density. They try to the, deposit the dose. That's why you notice it's just a little build up here. That's really explain why we always see the underdose uh, in this uh, tumor actually at the outer shell because the electrons try to deposit the dose in the outer shell. That's why uh, if you use a pencil beam uh, kind of algorithm, you're not going to predict that. That's why you are under dose in that regard. So in summary, uh, non small cell lung cancer is a very effective option, and I think there's more and more uh, study will focus on the comparison between even the surgery and the uh, radio, radio surgery. Uh, very good primary tumor control, very low toxicity. We rarely see any toxicity at all, like a radiation pneumonitis. It's a non-invasive procedure. But there are a lot of other things you have to consider, including immobilization, those calculation algorithm, margin design, motion management. All right, I just want to share with the last slide. This is actually happened in the last uh, month. Uh, our uh, Red, Con uh, Red Con Con Conculars team actually gathered together at the Detroit River Bank for uh, head for uh, cure uh, fundraising event. So actually everybody labeled with the slogan, uh, beaming ahead. I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>